Uh, my name is Rick Massaro. I'm a senior Android developer at Milwaukee Tool in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, we make smart power tools, Bluetooth. If you're interested in that, I'll talk to you about it afterwards. But right now, we're here to talk about uh, Coin. So before we uh, before we jump into it, um, can I ask who here is using? If, is anybody using Coin in um, any capacity whatsoever right now? No? Anybody uh, using the dagger? Okay. Uh, any other dependency injection libraries? Codeine, uh, toothpick, manual injection, spring, kind of counts. Uh, juice, I forgot that one too. Um, okay, who here is an Android developer? Alright, I've got some code samples that are Android, but this is pretty. Uh, 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 doesn't need to be like anything. Okay, so um, we talked about that, and now what is Coin? Um, if you pay attention to Android social media at all, you've probably heard about Coin. Uh, last few months, it's it's kind of a hot topic. Whether it's dependency injection, service locator, whether it's worth using, uh, it's getting a lot of attention. Um, we're going to not really focus on that, but uh, what we will talk about is that it is a, a library that's entirely written in Kotlin. It is open source, and uh, it's pretty new. So 1.0 came out a little over a year ago by Arno Giuliani. Well, the author is Arno Giuliani. He's an Android developer and decided that there's something better uh, that we can do with, with just Kotlin uh, to move away from Dagger. So he wrote this. came out a year and a half or a year ago. Uh, and then um, just a few months ago, which is what triggered, I think, a lot of the, the revised uh, uh, talk about it, is uh, 2.0 came out in, in May. And the way that I would characterize Coin is uh, it's kind of like a, a MacBook Pro. It's, this is a 2018 six-core MacBook Pro. Um, it's really easy to use except for the keyboard, and uh, it's more than fast enough for pretty much anything that you would want to do. It's um, it, it's it's a really really great experience for everybody. And on the other hand, um, Dagger, not not hating on Dagger, it's uh, it's like a headless Linux server. It's got uh, two processors, it's got 256 cores, and a terabyte of RAM, and uh, it's it's extremely powerful. It can do anything you could throw at it for forever, and it's going to scale really, really well. Um, it's also using something that you learned in college and you haven't really been using it since uh, Linux or Java, and uh, it's it's just not that fun to actually interface with at all. But you do it when you have to. So that, that's how I would characterize it, and uh, I'm going to pick at it a little bit throughout the talk. Um, in, uh, as a vehicle to talk about all this, we're going to have a little sample app. It's not going to be a coffee maker. Um, we're going to have um, a single screen, which requires a single view model. And that view model is going to depend upon a user ID and a repository. Um, and that repository is going to, in turn, uh, depend upon a service and a DAO, and uh, I, I mean retrofit and room. Um, and the, so the DAO is going to depend upon the room database, and that is, of course, going to depend upon the application context. And the service, meanwhile, is going to need a retrofit instance, which itself requires an LKHTTP client and a base URL. And let's look how we're going to build this using the normal control flow, or the normal control flow, um, which is legacy code. So in order to create our repository, um, we would again need reference to this, this DAO and this service. But in order to create them, we're going to need to create all of these other classes, the, uh, the database and the retrofit instance and the OKHTTP client. And this is really, really expensive. It's expensive in a few ways. Uh, first of all, that OKHTTP client takes about 150 milliseconds to initialize on, um, on a, a modern uh, like Pixel 3. Um, and uh, it's, it's expensive in terms of boilerplate. Now this is, like I said, it's a single screen app with a, it's, it's not doing anything really, but if you're creating a lot of repositories, you'd have to hard code this code because we can't inject anything here. You'd be hard coding this 
into every single class. You'd be creating it over and over and over again, um, and uh, nobody wants to type that. Every time you, you copy and paste it or type it, you're introducing risk for, uh, for error. And every time you're copying and pasting it, you're introducing, and you're introducing this risk, that means that you also need to test it. And if you have hard-coded uh, dependencies at the edge of your application here, um, like you're, you need an actual database and you need an actual um, retrofit service, uh, how, how do you test those? You could, uh, well, for the database, you could use, um, you know, Web Electric. For, uh, for the API, you could either test against an actual API, which is beyond horrible, or uh, you could use a proxy or a wiremark or something, but uh, nobody wants to do that. So what we're going to do instead is uh, introduce an inversion of control. Uh, and this typically gets broken down into two different categories, uh, which would be service location, or service locators, and dependency injection. What I mean by a service locator is uh, you'd have a, a reference to some singleton um, within, within the class itself, and uh, that singleton would then be responsible for either providing you an existing instance of your actual dependency or creating a new one for you. Um, that, that's reasonably straightforward. And uh, for dependency injection, we can break this down into two different categories. We have um, constructor injection, um, which is pretty much just parameters that you pass into a class, everybody gets that. Um, or you have field injection, where you create this mutable property, uh, which is then set uh, after the fact. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So in Android, sorry for the non-Android folks, um, we have uh, some core classes which we don't actually have control over the constructors on. Right? That would be services and fragments and, and uh, activities, typically. Um, and uh, this is also something, something that you can see in, in so many different libraries, um, where either you don't actually construct it and you just provide an, an interface which is then constructed for you and, and you have an object that meets your interface, or um, you have, say, activities where the the, the or sorry, fragments where the class can be recreated at any given time, like when you rotate the phone, and the framework is only going to use the no arg default constructor, so you can't pass anything using using constructor injection. So what you're going to do instead is this field injection thing, where you have the uh, the mutable property, um, which we could make nullable, but then we're going to have to have you know dot lets everywhere throughout our code. Um, or we can just assign it as a label. Then, uh, since this is a, a, we're requiring something else outside to do the, the injection, we would have some sort of injector object, which we would then be able to call, uh, get it inject and pass it ourselves, and then the, the uh, injector would be able to seek out the properties within the class which need to be injected, and inject them via some means. So now, with uh, uh, actually calling that call, what we're going to do is hook into our lifecycle, whether that's an onCreate or an init block or um, on start or on attach for fragments, uh, whatever you can get to uh, as early as possible, you'd be calling this injector object and say, hey, give me, give me this stuff that I need. Um, and I want to point out, that the injector is not returning the property because that would be a service locator. The injector is setting the property itself. The, the return type of the function is uh, you know, void or unit. And there are three problems with this, uh, as I see it. First is that the, the late init bar uh, has to be public so that the injector can actually access it. And, uh, so in this case, this is a view model. The view model is an implementation detail of this class, right? The, the view model is responsible for uh, performing business logic so that it can determine what the state of the view is going to be, which the activity of the screen is then observing to figure. It's it's not part of it's not a feature of the class. It's an implementation detail, but with uh, with these public properties, um, 
that view model can be accessed from anywhere. Um, and then you would be able to drill down and, and access all kinds of things, which are just implementation details. Um, this may be more of a style thing, a uh, nitpick, than, uh, than a real problem for uh, anyone's normal application. But if you think about libraries, um, uh, you're exposing this functionality to people that don't sit next to you that you can't trust. Um, and, and those end users will find every little, like, whatever they can do to make their thing work at that time. So I don't like that. Second thing I don't like is that it's mutable. Um, again, I'm picking on Android, but the concept of a view model is that it's, uh, it's persistent throughout the, the life of that view or of that screen, regardless of the configuration changes. That's, that's their whole point. But with it being mutable, you would be able to set a new view model whenever you want. And uh, not that, again, not that you would really want to do that, but you can, and stylistically, just don't stop. Um, so then the third thing is that it's laid in it. And um, it, when, when it's laid in it, you don't really know for sure when it's going to be set. Uh, you might want to be able to access properties from the laid in it, and you can't. Um, you might have an observer that's trying to reference this laid in it property before it's actually set. Uh, there's just so many problems that that can happen because of, of later nets. And uh, one thing that you could do anytime you wanted to access that later net uh, would be to wrap it up in, in a lazy uh, delegate. And uh, this makes it less likely that you're going to have any problems. But now this view state, in this case, could only be accessed after the, the view model has been initialized. And which means that you're either introducing the exact same risk with the view state as you would have been with the view model, or you're introducing um, more lazy delegates, and then without actually using coroutines or Rx, you're, you're still creating this entirely reactive flow just by using lazy delegates in your class, all because you have this lazy problem. Um, so we don't like lazy nits. Um, Let's go ahead and make this illegal state impossible and uh, switch to switch my there we go. Switch to constructor injection. Uh, this is the preferred way of uh, of handling dependency injection, and I'll show you why. First off, um, we can we can now make properties proper. Uh, because in order to create this repository, you need to have access to these classes, these objects from somewhere else. So um, in your testing, you're going to be able to get access to them from something else. And you don't need to make anything internal or public or anything else just for the sake of testing. But um, how are we going to uh, actually initialize this repository in this case? The, so if we, we remember the graph, the repository um, is something that the, the view model needs. So in the view model, we could construct it. But it takes those properties, and the view model doesn't have access to those properties. So now we need to get those properties. And we could do this by creating the database, creating the DAO, creating the service in the retrofit client, or the retrofit in the OKHTP client. But now this is the same as what we were doing before with the normal control flow. And obviously, we would do better we can inject those properties themselves. Now, the view model has everything that it needs in order to create the repository. But, of course, the only reason why we're injecting those is so that we can create the repository. So instead, we can just, we can just inject the repository itself. But now, how does the, the view model get created, right? Well, in the, uh, in the screen, in the activity, um, this looks very similar to what we just had. Uh, it's, it's the same problem, um, and uh, the, the activity doesn't actually have what it needs in order to create the view model. Uh, we need to inject that, but we can't inject it using the constructor because this is one of those classes where we don't have control over the constructor. So instead, we have to go back to this latent in bar. And uh, this, is, this is what we do with, with Dagger. The, the reigning king of dependency injection. Um, and I'm trying to make a point here, which is that uh, dependency injection is actually just kicking the can down the road. It does not know how to create instances of things. It just knows how to pass them around. 
Uh, if we want to create instances of them, we need the other pattern, which is service locators. So, um, hooking back into Android again, what we would be doing to uh, to get a view model with with Android is to use the uh, view model providers um, service locator, and there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, but basically we're calling this view model providers um, singleton uh, provider uh, service locator, and it's giving us the, the instance that we need. And because we're able to access it from outside, we don't need to make it public, and uh, we can just make it lazy because it's not actually getting set. It's just a thing that we have is guaranteed at compile time. Um, and uh, that's pretty much how it works. But this requires a lot of knowledge about how the, uh, how specifically the, the Android X lifecycle component works. You need to, you need to know how to, how to build this reference. Um, and it's kind of a lot of code uh, to write over and over and over again. So wouldn't it be nice if instead we had um, some generic locator uh, type singleton, another service locator, with um, a generic function, get, which, which could just figure out what we want and then give it to us without having to code in all that complexity over and over again. Um, it might look something like this. Um, two things to point out here, it's, it's inline and it's reified. And uh, the way inline reified works is that uh, Kotlin still has type erasure, um, same as Java. At compile time, we don't actually know um, what what the type is of anything that's used within a generic property or, or class. But um, with inline, we don't actually create this function. Um, if a function is inlined, then at compile time, all of the logic within that function is pulled out and put into the call site. So that call site, which might be looking for um, a list of strings, uh, knows that it's looking for a list of strings. And even though the, uh, the inline function is only looking for a list of t uh, in the code that you're looking at, at compile time, it goes to that other place where we know that it's a list of strings, so it becomes a list of strings. So that's, that's the magic of um, inline reified generics. Well, reified generics, which are only accessible from inline stuff. And uh, so what that allows us to do here is this code would not compile if it was not reified, but it is, so it will. Uh, we're able to check the type of that generic type T and uh, determine what sort of class it is. And then we can do a lookup into um, a graph for that T, or we can just have a, a ginormous uh, when block like this where we know the type and we're able to perform different actions depending upon what it is. So we could you know, take this further and say, all right, well now we have a user presenter and uh, just add another line to our, our when block and it scales very, very well. Uh, but a problem with this is that we're now locked into a single dependency graph, right? It's, uh, it's just moved around. It's kind of the same as normal control flow. Um, but we can fix this by using something called the singleton objects uh, interface pattern where we have an interface with a companion object and that late init var instance within the companion object is actually what is referenced um, in this get function. So we can create a locator with normal production uh, code and use that from you know, application on create, like the start of your, of your application um, throughout normal production code. But in testing, we can write a different locator and, and set that and use any uh, test stubs or fakes or locks that we would like. Um, and that's really, really convenient. Somebody should write a library for that, and they have, and it's called Coin. Um, so let's finally start talking about Coin by talking about Coin. And that's really confusing. But uh, Coin is the name of the library, and it's also a class. Um, so right now we're going to talk about the class. This is essentially the dependency graph and um, service locator of the entire library. Um, I have a single graph here 
It actually has a lot of different graphs, but simplicity. Um, it has functions for uh, getting and setting um, those uh, those bindings and those properties, and uh, it holds all of the logic necessary to construct anything that you might want. And then this coin class instance is uh, wrapped up by another class called coin application. Um, coin application is of course the again the wrapper for the coin instance, and then it also has um, some functions for um, setting modules, for setting bindings, and uh, um, a couple of other little convenience things, including closing the graph. One thing to point about this, point out about this, is that it is not an Android application. Uh, right? We have Dagger application, which is supposed, which is an abstract class. Your normal application would uh, extend that, and that's not what this is. It's it's an entirely separate thing. Um, getting, I'll get more into that in a second, um, because we have this other thing called a global context, and this is pretty much what you would expect. Um, it's reasonably similar to what I just described with the, the locator. Um, it has this um, this var for the uh, coin application. So this is what holds the you know the global coin application that you might want, um, and then convenience methods for for getting that and, and accessing it and starting it, starting and stopping. Um, so this allows us to have a global context, but what it also allows for us allows us to do is to have other instances of coin. Um, because coin itself is not a singleton, coin application is not a singleton. Um, so you can create multiple dependency graphs which exist in your app at the same time, um, which is really convenient um, for, well, it's really useful for very, very specific edge cases of, of handling wildly different scopes without having to do a lot of refactoring. So now let's get into some code that we actually write with uh, start coin and, and coin application. These two things are, are basically the same thing. They're the builders for coin application um, with two differences. The, um, the start coin, oops. Is supposed to be a thing there. So start coin has this global context dot start. So this is the one that you want to use nearly all the time. When you're creating a coin instance and a coin application and you want it to be accessible from everywhere, start coin will set that to the same time. And it also does this thing called um, create eager instances. Basically when you're creating a, a binding, um, there's a flag you can set so that if it's a singleton, it will be immediately initialized without actually being accessed anywhere. So if you think about um, a large application which might have um, God classes or um, orchestrator classes that are actually just observing other things and they need to be up and running immediately, with Dagger you might initialize your graph and then immediately inject them into, say, your application class and, and, and do your initialization. With coin, all that's taken care of for you, and you don't actually have to have them as properties in some other object. Um, and that's where the alpha is going to be. So uh, now let's actually write some stuff. Uh, in our application class, first we would call start coin um, right away in iCreate, and then we would add uh, a line for Android Logger if this is Android. And uh, we do that because that's what every guide tells you to do. And this is what that looks like. Um, basically, coin, uh, coin has debug messages. And uh, normally, they just go to you know, system.out. Um, but with Android Logger, that all gets piped through uh, you know, our java.util.log. But I don't like java.util.log. I use Timber. Uh, it's a logging library. And uh, so I looked at this code. And I said, let's go ahead and change it. Let's, uh, let's create our own um, subclass of logger and add um, you know, timber logic for it and then make this factory function, which uh, is, is what we're accessing from the start coin. And uh, now we can have everything go right through timber. And it's really, really easy to do. It took a few minutes. And then I'm going to make a point about that later. So next, what we need to do, again, for Android, 
Um, so many things that we're creating in Android require an application context. There's a convenience function for that. Uh, Android context, you pass in the application instance, which has your application context. And uh, that is actually our first dependency that we've added to our graph. And then finally, and I'm going to gloss over this, um, in order to uh, add all of our bindings to the graph, it's just a single line, um, modules, and then you pass in your modules. Um, and uh, so this coin demo modules is a list of modules, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, because now it's time to talk about modules. To create a module in coin, you just make a top level val. Um, and uh, use this module builder keyword that's uh, part of the DSL. So inside this module, you then uh, you can declare a factory, which is uh, another keyword in the DSL, and um, then you pass in the object that you want to create. So in this case, uh, we're, we're declaring a module which is capable of producing the user repository. Um, and uh, by calling it a factory, it's going to create a new instance of the user repository every time it's accessed. And I've said DSL a couple of times now. DSLs are, are they sometimes look like magic. Um, this isn't magic, it's just a, a function that takes a, a lambda as its last parameter. It's a high level function. And uh, so it, it, it looks crazy, but it's really not. So long as it's returning the, uh, the object that you want, you can do whatever you want in it, because uh, it's, it's nothing special. But don't do that. Um, and I've called these a couple of things now, dependencies and, uh, and, and bindings. Um, really, in the documentation, the object that you're creating here is called a bean definition. Um, but in, uh, in Arnout's talks and in a lot of other places, uh, they're referred to as components. So now I'm going to start calling them components. Um, conceptually, this is nothing like uh, a Dagger component. Um, it's it's just just a similar name. Modules, on the other hand, are conceptually very much like Dagger components. They're just logical groupings. There's no hierarchy to them. Uh, you can have as many as you like. You can have one, which is thousands of lines long, or one module for each dependency. Doesn't matter. So. Um, We've talked about how to create a single dependency, um, and uh, now we need to let Coin know about it. I said I was glossing over this earlier, uh, this Coin demo modules. Um, it's just a top-level list, a top-level property, which is a list, and uh, it was currently it was empty. And then we add our data, data module to it. This is similar to again in Dagger, using um, you know includes uh, in a in a definition, same thing. Now, since Coin Demo Modules is already being added to uh, the Coin application, uh, now the data module is part of the dependency graph. But this uh, this repository has dependencies of its own, right? We were hard coding them before, and we can clean this up considerably. We can move the service and the DAO into the constructor, um, and note that we can also make them private. Since again, we're going to have access to them when we create the repository, so we don't need to get them from the repository. And uh, now we've broken our module that we just wrote, because this is a no R constructor, and now it takes two parameters. So we can get those parameters from the graph just by calling get. Uh, get will easily, or sorry, eagerly resolve the dependencies from the graph itself. Um, and it's doing this without actually having to specify any types because the repository constructor is very explicit in what it needs, right? It doesn't say, um, I need a service of type any and, or a DAO of type asterisk. It says, you know, I need a user service and a user DAO. So um, that inline reified function works. And uh, so long as we've declared those two uh, dependencies in our graph, we'll be able to resolve them. But of course, now we need to get those dependencies, or the dependencies of those dependencies. And here's what that is for the user service, right? We needed that retrofit instance and the OK HTTP client. And two things to point out about this. Uh, 
for the retrofit instance, we're using get, not in the constructor, but in this client function in the builder. Doesn't matter because get is not magic, it's just an inline reified function which works everywhere. And the second is um, for the user service, uh, we're using get to uh, to access the instance of that retrofit instance without actually passing it at all. So it can be used just like a normal variable. Then we're going to do the same thing with the DAO, uh, which requires the, uh, the, the room database. And uh, in this case, we're going to use the Android context um, that we added to the graph back in Startcoin, as well as um, using user DAO, which is a function in Java, but uh, in Kotlin it just looks like a property. So what we're doing here is we're not actually creating an instance, we're accessing something from within our room database's generated class, and it will return an instance for us. So so long as we can get an instance, that's all that really matters. So I wanted to make a point about this, which is that it's pretty difficult to read. Obviously, again, you can organize your modules however you'd like, but um, beside that, we've got stuff where we're, we're, deferring, we're, we're explicitly uh, declaring the type as part of the function call, um, and others where we're just accessing it from inside the function call, or we're even inferring it in the case of retrofit. And uh, so anytime I'm writing a module like this, um, I make sure to just align everything um, so it's, it's nice and legible in the, same, in the same spot and you don't have to go digging throughout the code. So um, the other thing that we ought to look at with this is the efficiency of it. Um, earlier I complained that these are expensive to create and we're creating them every single time and we are still doing that here, right? We're calling factory for every single thing. And uh, we don't have to because coin has another keyword, single, which creates singleton references. Notice that we're not going to do this for the user DAO, because that user DAO is, again, just delegating to the logic that's already been optimized by Android, and uh, we don't need to worry about it. Um, also, I'd point out that prior to Coin 2.0, single was called bean. So if you're digging through documentation and you see bean, you're like, what the hell is this? It's, it's just single. And actually now there's a type alias, so you could continue using Bean, and it's just single. So, um, so far we've been accessing properties from within the graph, from within the graph, but we need to be able to get stuff from outside the graph, otherwise there's no point. So, let's say we have a screen, which conspicuously isn't part of any sort of class hierarchy, and uh, let's assume that it needs a repository. Uh, we can access it like this. We can call globalcontext.get, which would give us that coin instance, and then .get again, and that would give us, that's that inline reified function, which would give us the, uh, the user repository uh, instance. But this is really gross. I don't want to type this. Fortunately, we have a, a shortcut. It's called coin component. It's just a marker interface. And uh, then there are extension functions upon coin component to give us reference to the get function and, and some other keywords without without needing to write all that boilerplate. Uh, but it gets better if you're an Android developer, because again, the author is an Android developer. Since Coin Component doesn't actually have any magic, it's just extension functions. Here are the same extension functions for activity um, by way of uh, component callbacks. So it's actually, it works for um, activities, fragments, and um, Android services. And um, in the same way that he wrote those extension functions for component callbacks, there's nothing stopping you from writing those same functions for anything else, or even top-level functions, so that you don't need to use more interface. It's just that he did not do that. It's not a feature of the library. So now um, our our screen shouldn't be dealing with the repository though, it should be dealing with the, the view model, and the view model should be taking the repository. So let's add the, uh, let's add the view model which needs that repository to our graph. And we can do this using a new keyword called view model, and this is again Android specific, but the logic behind it is not. Um, 
this behaves similar to a single singleton in that anytime you call view model, it's going to give you the same reference, um, but that reference is uh, in a different scope than a singleton, and it's a different scope than a uh, factory. And uh, well, let's add it to our module, and then we'll look at the screen and see what that means exactly. So we were calling it with a get, uh, which is eager and it's it's bad. We can't do this because the uh, the the view model needs to be linked to the lifecycle of the screen. What we can do instead is uh, use a by view model delegate, and uh, this is again an extension upon uh, lifecycle uh, lifecycle owner and uh, another Android thing, and it links it adds a listener. Um, to the lifecycle, bypassing view model providers entirely, and uh, observes the lifecycle, and just automatically destroys the view model when that lifecycle goes into the destroyed state. So, no dealing with any of the legacy Java implementations. It just handles it all on its own. Um, does the same thing, just a lot cleaner, way, way, way cleaner. So, what about if you wanted something else? Um, the, the view model is a lazy delegate which only works for view models, but you can do the same thing with inject for any other class. Uh, it will, instead of uh, resolving a dependency eagerly, um, it'll just pull it from the graph whenever you need it. This is kind of shorthand for doing um, by lazy with a get. And uh, this can be used in uh, component callbacks for Android classes, but it could also just be used with coin compa components or by directly accessing that uh, global context. So next up, we're going to talk about qualifiers. Um, they're conceptually very similar to qualifiers in so many other libraries. Um, let's say you have uh, two types in your graph, which are there are two objects in your graph, which are actually of the same type. Um, in this case, coroutine scope. You have a coroutine scope that's uh, using the default um, main, sorry, main dispatcher, and another one which is using I.O. But they're both of type coroutine scope. Um, so coin isn't going to know what to do about this, it wouldn't build. Uh, we need to be able to provide, we need to provide some way for coin to differentiate between them. And uh, this is a, a, a property that you can pass into this factory function. It's the first property. Um, it's called a qualifier. There's a couple of different types of qualifiers, but the one which everybody uses for everything because it's convenient is string qualifier, uh, where you just pass in a name. And uh, now, if we were able to, if we wanted to access um, a coroutine scope from the graph, and specifically the main coroutine scope, um, at the consumer side, we, we again just pass in that same qualifier, and now Coin's going to say, oh, yeah, I know that. You want the uh, the main coroutine scope? I'm going to give you that one with dispatchers.main. Now you can also say uh, you can have one one unqualified version and then a qualified version, which uh, you'll see a lot in examples of like mock or testing, and uh, that's fine if you don't specify that you would want a mock one or a testing one. You get the normal instance, and then uh, if you specify testing, obviously you get that one. So, parameters. Um, I love parameters. Uh, this is something that's been really, 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 really awkward for Dagger. Uh, so much so that there's a third party library, pretty much written by Jake Wharton, um, called Assistant Inject, um, just to handle parameters. And by parameters, I mean runtime parameters. Um, it's one thing if you can know at compile time that you always need this particular DAO or this particular view model. But what do you do about user input um, or uh, you know user ID or or something like that? And remember uh, back at the start, I said that our view model had two dependencies. There's the repository, and then there's that that user ID. Uh, we have to add this to the module definition. And how do we do that? Uh, again, the the DSL is not magic, it's, it's just a regular lambda, and uh, you can pass in this um, parameters object, which uh, 
again, it's just a lambda, and it, it takes whatever number of parameters you specify, like, like so. So in this case, we want a user ID um, as a runtime condition, so that's one parameter. And then whilst constructing the, uh, the view model, we're going to use that in addition to the repository, which we already know how to get. At the call site, um, instead of passing in empty parentheses, like you see with that by inject, we would pass in a lambda, and uh, that lambda would have this parameters of object, uh, which is just a regular plain old Kotlin Poco, Pojo Poco object, which gets dereferenced to uh, to become this lambda. And um, that's really it. So now if we want to create a view model with a user ID um, of 50 cent, because coin, uh, we pass in that parameters of object and it'll know what to do. It takes it from there. So now let's talk about scope. We've already been talking about scope. We talked about factories and singletons, which are the two extremes of scope. And uh, I didn't call it out specifically, but when we were talking about view models, we are also talking about scopes. It's a scope which lasts from you know, the creation of the screen to the end of the screen. Um, and that's something that we want. We, we, we want to be able to have scopes which are, are in between those two extremes. We've actually been uh, creating scopes as well. So this is a screenshot of what the IDE is telling me. Um, every time we create a component, everything inside that component is part of the scope. Now that's a super overloaded term because what does scope mean? Uh, there's, uh, you know, apply is a scoping function or, um, you know, any function, a normal function has a scope. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about a specific class within coin called scope. And uh, things within that scope are alive until the entire scope is closed and then they're killed off. And when I said that the view model is put into a special graph, the special graph that it's put into is a graph for that scope. So, when we, uh, when we want to create a scoped object, we use a new keyword, it's called scoped. And uh, so this is comparable to a factory or single or view model. And then we put that inside a scope set builder, um, where that uh, scope set now takes, uh, uh, it's called scope name, but it's actually a qualifier, same as what we already talked about. And uh, in this case, the classic example of scoping is, is a login session, right? And we've got that user ID, 50 cent. So what we're gonna do here is create a scope using login. And uh, so this scope will last from the time the user is logged in until the time the user logs out. And uh, so inside this scope set, we declare any of the components which uh, we want to persist only throughout that scope. And uh, we can put however many components we would like in there. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you had a diary, put that in there, and it'll everything will be destroyed when the uh, scope is destroyed. And of course, now we need to add that to our list of modules so that Coin knows what to do with them. So then at the consumer side, um, outside of the graph, uh, what we would need to do is to create a scope using this create scope keyword function. Um, passing it that qualifier of login, which tells us what type of scope it is, and then the other qualifier of the user ID. So now if we were to have another scope of type login with a, a user ID of something else, it would not get the same objects. And of course, uh, when we're done with the scope, we need to close it in order to destroy these, so when the user logs out, this scope would need to be canceled. And in order to pass this scope around, it would actually need to be a property of uh, constructors. And for Android developers, we get something better. Uh, we have another keyword called current scope, which uh, will uh, get the class type of the calling, calling class and automatically create a scope for us. Uh, so this is what we use for, behind the hood, this is sort of under the hood, this is what ViewModel is using um, in order to create these, uh, uh, their scopes, but it can apply to any other class um, where you, uh, you use current scope and you'll get something specifically for that screen type, and then uh, as soon as the screen is destroyed, 
the current scope is automatically closed. So, still talking about Android, uh, there's a new feature called Dynamic Features, uh, where uh, we have modules which are load on demand um, for application classes, and this is really tricky because a, a module which does not exist at the start of an application cannot be loaded into the dependency graph for that application. As a matter of fact, the application level um, module has no knowledge of whatsoever of that class. So what we do instead is, uh, in, our in our dynamic module, we would create um, a, a feature modules uh, type property of its own, and then we can create a, uh, a lazy uh, property within that, uh, within that module, and uh, that lazy property, which now will only be executed once, the lambda will only be executed once, we would call load coin modules. And uh, we'd pass in the new modules for uh, for that module. So then this would be accessed from a function called innate, innate modules, and at whatever point is the starting point of that of that module, whatever activity that is, um, in its init block, you would say load modules, init modules, and now your entire graph is complete. So finally, we'll talk about testing. Um, there are two things that Coin really, really shines at. Um, first is overriding modules. This is something which is extraordinarily difficult in Dagger. Um, creating, creating, dynamically creating uh, different dependency graphs for, for different functions. So what we'd be doing instead in Dagger, um, for our repository, <coughs> we wouldn't actually be using Dagger at all. We would just create a mock service and a mock DAO and then inject them manually and perform our tests. In Coin, we have this keyword, this marker interface, Coin Test. So we can use that in our test class, and uh, it's similar to Coin Component, where it just gives us access to the normal graph. So now, uh, in our setup function, we can use Start Coin and pass in whatever modules we would like, and then in our Teardown function, we close the graph, and uh, now we're able to create a new dependency graph for every single uh, test. It's nice and hermetic. So now, we would be able to uh, create a repository um, just by accessing the graph and not worrying about the dependencies itself. But I said overriding modules, and this isn't. This is just creating the same hard-coded thing. What Coin allows us to do is it gives us this tag for override, and um, by saying override equals true, which you can do at the component level, at the scope set level, or at the module level, anything within within those curly braces will override anything which was already declared. So we can create our mock surface and our mock DAO, pass them into the graph. Everything else in the graph is going to use normal classes. And um, for the purposes of our repository, we will get uh, those mocked instances. So, um, oh, right, and you also need to add it to the graph, which I already did. So the last, the final thing is um, checking the graph. Uh, everybody talks about um, the compile time safety of, of, of Dagger, and that's really great. It's great that you cannot build anything without all the dependencies that you need, except that when, for when that doesn't work. But you can do that with Coin2, something that people don't really seem to know. Um, there's, a, there's a function called check modules. And it does exactly what it sounds like it does. It goes through every single uh, component in every single module in your entire graph and make sure that nothing that you're saying you can create um, will, will fail because you don't actually have something to find for it. So this module, um, if we didn't have an OK HTTP client, everything would fail. It does check. Um, this respects qualifiers, it respects scopes and scope sets. It gives you everything you need. On the other hand, it does not check stuff outside of the graph. Um, so this activity, which is accessing it using those delegates, um, would would potentially you know have errors if, uh, for instance, this diary wasn't uh, wasn't contained. Yeah. But this happens with with Dagger as well, right? Um, how many times have we seen crashes? Those of us that use Dagger, where uh, we're accessing something which is not in the graph. 
Um, Dagger doesn't know how to check it. Coin doesn't know how to check it. It can't be checked. So um, in summary, it's, it's really simple. I just showed you everything it has to offer in 45 minutes. Um, any questions you can have uh, can be answered just by command clicking on a function, seeing what it does. Um, it isn't generated code. It's, uh, it's not magic. You can, you can see all of it. You can see exactly what it's doing. And if you can't figure it out for yourself, there's amazing documentation uh, to help you. Um, it is safe. Uh, check modules works. If you, if you run any kind of CI at all, you're safe. Um, it might be safer because you have these immutable valves and stuff related in bars. Um, it's extensible. If you don't like exactly what it's doing, if you want a uh, convenience function, you can write it because uh, it's not generated code. Um, and uh, that's really it. Try it yourself. You'll like it. I promise. If you, if you want to, here's some more reading. Um, documentation for Android specifically, documentation for Coin, that's the official stuff, uh, for Coin Core, um, that's their GitHub, and these are the slides for what you just saw. Uh, thank you so much. Again, I'm Rick Passaro. There's my Twitter, Medium, and Kotlin Lame Slack, and uh, that's it. <laughs>